Palestine, a land divided, a holy place, a battleground, a homeland claimed by both Arabs and Jews. By 1947, the lines were drawn. To the Jews, Palestine is their traditional and spiritual home, the promised land. But the majority of the inhabitants of Palestine are Arabs. They too regard Palestine as their rightful home. But with the end of the war, into Palestine ports came ship after ship crammed with illegal immigrants, refugees from recent persecution in Germany, Austria, Poland, Belsen and Dachau. The Arabs, fearful of becoming a minority, persuaded the British to limit Jewish immigration. Jewish extremists attacked British troops, wrecked government buildings, blew up trains and ships. And so Palestine remains, a place of martial law, where all go their ways only under watch, where the innocent must suffer with the guilty. Great Britain had ruled Palestine for three decades. After years of strenuous but unavailing effort, His Majesty's government have reached the conclusion that they are not able to bring about a settlement in Palestine based upon the consent of both Arabs and Jews, and that the mandate is no longer workable. A York transport landing at Leda Airport brings delegates to the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. The UN committee considered the partition of Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state. On the shoulders of these delegates rests a heavy responsibility. But the Arabs did not want to talk to the committee. They wanted nothing to do with the Jews. Sabri ad Din was an honorable sheikh and an eloquent speaker. And he said, if the Jews want to take Palestine from us, we swear that we will throw them into the sea. And he pointed to the Mediterranean, which was a few hundred meters from the place where we had gathered. The Arab leadership believed that if a partition was imposed, they could reverse it by force. Jamal Husseini, the chairman of the Arab Higher Committee, said that only four to five hundred riflemen can easily take over Tel Aviv. While the committee was still in Palestine, a ship called Exodus arrived in Haifa, loaded with Jewish Holocaust survivors. But now she had on board some 5,000 Jews who'd hoped to enter Palestine illegally. When she was boarded at sea by the Navy, a fierce battle was fought on her decks, resulting in many casualties on both sides. The UN committee saw firsthand the immigrants' despair when they were forced to return to Europe. The Jews argued that refugees needed a home and that they would not be welcomed by an Arab state. The UN committee agreed. They recommended that Palestine be partitioned when the British pulled out. We felt that what had happened to the Palestinians was unjust, and that the division of Palestine was not fair. The Arabs were outraged. We had a man called Mustafa Mu'min, who managed to penetrate literally into the circle of the Security Council to read a letter written in the blood of some, several thousand Egyptian Muslim brothers denouncing Israel and, uh, and the support of Israel and so on. You all know how to vote. Those who are in favor will say yes, those who are against will say no. The 
No one relied on the calculations made by the president of the assembly. Each person held his own pencil and piece of paper and calculated whether or not there was two-thirds for the partition or not. The United Kingdom, abstain. The United States, yes. Uruguay, yes. Venezuela, and towards the end, during the last countries, USA, Venezuela, etc., we found there was two-thirds. We jumped from our places with joy. We wept, we hugged, we kissed. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. I was glad, I was very glad, because for me it was important that the UN, according to the decree of nations, was giving, granting the Jews, I'd say the Zionists, an independent country on the land of Israel. And I thought in my heart, history is turning a huge page. The news was broadcast at 8 p.m. The Palestinian people listened to it everywhere, and there was this feeling of frustration and sadness, a feeling of catastrophe which was about to befall Palestine. Riots and demonstrations started everywhere. The Arabs attacked Jews and the Jews hit back. Cities and neighborhoods were divided along religious lines. In Jerusalem, an Arab car bomb destroyed the Jewish agency offices. Seven were killed, more than a hundred wounded. The Fifty Years' War was underway. Palestinian forces from towns and villages along the road to Jerusalem were commanded by Abdul Qader El Husseini. They blocked supplies going from Jewish-held Tel Aviv to a besieged Jerusalem. Keeping the Jews of Jerusalem supplied was the first priority of the Jewish army, the Haganah. They tried to defend the convoys. It was very hard to protect the convoys. We had a huge number of casualties among the convoy escorts, and there was a big waste of product. When a convoy got through, the whole city knew. The trucks brought vital supplies. Flour. We really needed matches. And cigarettes. Can you imagine soldiers without cigarettes? We were kept alive by the convoy from Tel Aviv. We started with uh, military operations to make sure that the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem will not be endangered by the big villages or towns that were along the road, uh, where from came all the attackers on the convoys. A special Haganah brigade was formed to open the road to Jerusalem. The system was to attack the village, to give warning to the civilians, to destroy the village, and by the elimination of the villages alone and adjacent to the road, we were sure that there would be no attacks. The Jews tried to seize Castel, a village controlling the road to Jerusalem. It was a Palmach unit, my troops, that captured the Castel. And it was here that Abdel Qadir el Husseini, the Palestinian leader, was killed. Enraged, Husseini's soldiers went to recover the body of their leader. 
The Arabs counterattacked. Our reinforcements were wiped out. It was a very black day. Down the road from Castel, there would be another battle that day. Two Jewish extremist organizations, Irgun and Lehi, which had fought the British, were eager to prove themselves in the new war. It was such a tragedy. Der Yassin was a lovely village. The events at Der Yassin would haunt relations between Jews and Arabs for years to come. Der Yassin had stayed out of the fighting. It was not on the Haganah's list of hostile villages. I ran into a man who had left us for the terrorists. He told me that the Irgun and Lehi had got permission from our commander to attack the village of Dir Yassin. He was very proud. The Irgun and Lehi forces were ordered to take Dir Yassin. I ran to my commander and asked, why did you allow it? He said, I suggested two other targets. They turned them down. He said, I can't shoot them, can I? So I decided to spy on them. Their loudspeakers blared out, lay down your arms. Run for your lives. Then I heard our machine gun. I was kneeling down like this. When I looked up, I saw the village ablaze. Their attack lit up the whole village. The village was not the soft target the Jews had expected. From the windows of their houses, Arabs were shooting at our soldiers. And from a force of 132, we had 42 wounded and six dead. The commander ordered a house-to-house -house attack. So I gave the order. Before entering a house, throw a couple of grenades inside. They threw a grenade into one house. 28 were killed. It was impossible to attack the enemy without hurting their families. It was difficult. It was painful, and I'm sorry we had to do it. But we had no choice. After the battle, they took 14 prisoners. They lined them up by the quarry and mowed them down. They threw their bodies in the quarry. That's what happened. While this was going on, Jews came from the next village. Most of them were religious, by the way. They started yelling, bastards, murderers, what are you doing? Some shouted in Hebrew, others in Yiddish. They stopped the massacre. 110 Arabs died in Dir Yassin. Some died fighting, others were murdered. The survivors were taken to Jerusalem. We gathered in Jerusalem at the Hebron Gate. We checked who was missing and who had survived. Then the Palestinian leaders arrived, including Dr. Khalidi. I asked Dr. Khalidi how we should cover the story. He said, we must make the most of this. So he wrote a press release stating that at Dir Yassin, children were murdered, pregnant women were raped, all sorts of atrocities. Arab radio stations passed on the false reports, ignoring the protests of the witnesses.
We said there was no rape. He said, we have to say this, so the Arab armies will come to liberate Palestine from the Jews. This was our biggest mistake. We did not realize how our people would react. As soon as they heard that women had been raped at Deir Yassin, Palestinians fled in terror. They ran away from all our villages. In the next few months, over half the Arab population, three quarters of a million people fled their homes in Palestine. Israel never allowed them back. The British did little to prevent the atrocities committed by both sides. As they prepared to leave, they washed their hands of the whole mess. At the United Nations, the Jews announced their plans. Not later than May 16th next, a provisional Jewish government will commence to function in cooperation with the representatives of the United Nations then in Palestine. The Jewish leadership sought political support abroad. America, it's hard to the U.S. State Department argued against it. Their first response was, no country, no state. Ben-Gurion sent his close colleague, Moshe Charette, to convince the Americans to recognize the proposed Jewish state. Charette tried to persuade Secretary of State George Marshall, who was totally opposed to the idea. Charette explained that we have no other way than to proceed. This is a historic juncture. If we miss that, we may create a tragedy for future generations. But President Truman surprised everyone with his strong support. I was told by all these so-called experts that if it was done, it would involve the whole Near East in a war, and it would also involve the United States. Hitler had been murdering Jews right and left. I saw it, and I dream about it even to this day. The Jews needed some place where they could go. It was my attitude that the American government couldn't stand idly by while the victims of Hitler's madness are not allowed to build new lives. Marshall was worried that war would break out. We are in the midst of a very critical situation. We should therefore carefully avoid approaching international problems on an emotional basis. He wanted to maintain good relations with the Arabs. I was on the receiving end of Azam Pasha's uh, impressions uh, of his meeting with Marshall. And he was happy. I mean, he felt uh, much more reassured about the Americans after having talked to Marshall than before. And we had the Saudis with us. They were our partners in this business. Two days before the British left Palestine, Truman summoned Marshall to the White House. Clark Clifford was asked to support the case for a Jewish state. General Marshall started off. The uh, president listened attentively and then said, uh, I would like now to hear from Clark. But as I spoke, I saw Marshall's face getting redder and redder. And when I finished, he exploded. Marshall accused Truman of a transparent dodge to win the Jewish vote. Clark Clifford did not disguise the fact that Marshall was raging mad. They don't need a state, they don't deserve a state, it isn't theirs. <clears throat> They've stolen that land. Uh, these were Marshall's words. He turned to the press 
said, I'm obliged, Mr. President, to tell you that if you should adopt the policy that is recommended by Clifford, I would be unable to vote for you in this coming election in November. Well, dead silence in the room. No one had ever heard anything like that. I had never heard anybody threaten the President of the United States in that manner. Before Marshall could go any further, Truman ended the meeting. I gathered my papers together, and the President said, well, that was tough as a cob. Marshal Tet said to uh, Charette, well, it's your decision. Uh, don't count that we uh, can bail you out, but uh, you, we know that you have reached an historic stage and uh, God protect you. Eastward, the Arab Legion poised for invasion on the Transjordan border. The rarely photographed King Abdullah reviewed a brigade of reinforcements from Iraq. Marshall's prediction of war was about to come true. Five Arab states mobilized on the border, threatening to enter Palestine and crush a Jewish state, if it came into being. For the Jews of Palestine, this was a critical moment. Ben-Gurion was determined to go ahead with or without international support. I had to act fast. I didn't consult anyone. Today, the British mandate over the land of Israel ends. We declare a Jewish state in the ancient land of Israel. It will be called the State of Israel. At the same time, the UN's role in Palestine was supposed to end. When the hands pointed to six o'clock, the Iraqi delegate got up and said, Mr. President, there is a very important matter to consider before we proceed. The time is one minute past six. Indeed, I think it is two minutes. The United States delegate, when he came to this rostrum, declared that if by six o'clock we cannot arrive into, at any conclusion, the whole game is up, and I hold that to you, Mr. President, to give us your ruling. The time is past six now. That was about the only occasion when the Iraqi delegate and I have ever agreed on anything. Uh, he was uh, full of exuberance because he thought the game is up and now the road is open for the Arab invasion. Uh, I felt that the game is up and that meant that we were free to establish our state without uh, being accused of impinging upon an international decision. Then the news from Israel arrived. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. Scarcely had the United States pronounced its words of recognition, and almost unnoticed by our own delegation, which was still celebrating our American victory, Andrew Gromyko rose and uh, said that the Soviet Union, which, unlike the Western powers, which has abandoned the Jewish people to its dark and fearful fate, the Soviet Union recognizes the state of Israel. And therefore, I would say that the issue of Israel's recognition was uh, solved almost miraculously within a few hours of our independence declaration. After 2,000 years of exile, the Jewish people had a state of their own. But even as they danced, Israel's fate hung in the balance. The day after Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel, the armies of Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria invaded.
But the largest Arab army, that of Egypt, had only been tested on the parade ground. At its head was the playboy King Farouk. The king uh, hadn't had any experience of war. Nobody, in fact, had any experience of war, including the commander-in-chief of the Egyptian army, you see. At the time, a euphoria reigned in the Arab ranks. The boys were very pleased with the war. They thought it was a good idea. But they had no idea of, of the logistics uh, uh, and the problems they were going to face. Still, the Arab states, with a population of 40 million, looked certain to overwhelm Israel's half million Jews. It seemed that Ben-Gurion's new state would last only a few days. We thought it was going to be a pushover, that the, that the Jews were going to run away the moment they saw the Arab um, regular army uniform moving on to them with bayonets and whatever. Egypt's army, attacking from the south, headed towards the main Jewish center, Tel Aviv. Jordan's Arab Legion took the West Bank and the old city of Jerusalem. The Syrians moved towards Nazareth, while the Lebanese attacked from the north. The Arab regular armies converged on Palestine, superior in numbers and equipment. Early in the war, they had a number of victories. Whenever they overran Israeli villages, the inhabitants were either expelled or killed. The Egyptian army was finally halted only 20 miles from Tel Aviv. The Israelis were fighting for their survival, and after three weeks of fierce resistance, they brought the Arabs to a standstill. We had no aircraft. We had no tanks. And we were going into war this way. We hardly even had guns. We would try to buy guns as much as we could, anywhere we could. In this situation, we were really saved by Czechoslovakia, that is, Russia. America didn't give us arms. When the, 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 the weapons came in, the whole balance of power changed. And the Israelis would then pass on to the offensive. We weren't even mentally prepared. We just weren't ready. So our officers were confused and panic-stricken. And so the Egyptian army was, was surrounded, and then uh, the Jordanian army just kept neutral, didn't interfere in any way. Finally, our prime minister here in Egypt, Nokrashi Pasha, was murdered by the Muslim Brothers. And uh, his successor said, there's no future in this war. Let's make peace. But there was no peace, only a ceasefire agreement. The Arabs believed a peace treaty would be an acknowledgment of defeat. Both sides mourned their dead. Even before the ceasefire agreements were signed, Israel held its first democratic election. Ben-Gurion and his Labour Party won. Israel celebrated the triumph of its armed forces. But the Arabs refused to recognize Israel's right to exist. 
for the Arabs. The legacy of the 48 war was the displacement of the Palestinian people. The Palestinians now faced political extinction. The West Bank was annexed by Jordan, and Gaza was ruled by Egypt, which left them with nothing. Egypt, the most powerful Arab country, was shaken by the defeat. A group of young officers, frustrated by the incompetence of the king and the new prime minister, plotted a coup. I went to the prime minister and delivered the ultimatum to him. He was shocked, believe me, because up till this moment, he didn't know that we were going to dethrone the king at all. He was shocked and received me like this. I told him, yes. He said, are you, are, you, are you powerful enough? I told him, yes. Go and deliver it to the king. He must leave by 6 o'clock this, uh, this evening. From Cairo come these first authentic pictures of the bloodless coup by which the army took over control of Egypt. It was the end of the king's attempt to maintain power. As we took the king to the ship, he said, you ate me for lunch before I could eat you for dinner. Egypt's new leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser, pledged radical reform. There were six principles to put an end to uh, colonialism, to put an end to feudalism, put an end to uh, corrupted uh, of uh, uh, exploitation by capitalism. I read that Nasser was going to Yugoslavia. I thought President Tito could help make peace. I knew a friend of Tito's. I asked him to go to Yugoslavia. I said, get Tito to ask Nasser if he will make peace. Tito passed on the message. Nasser said that if he was seen talking to Israel, he would be overthrown, even killed. Sharet, Ben-Gurion's foreign minister, initiated more secret contacts. Sharet believed the best way to ensure the security of Israel was to understand the Arabs and negotiate peace. Sharet sent Yvonne to Paris, the UN General Assembly's temporary home. I told a friend I was ordered to Paris to meet Arabs, and he said, Zima, I know you like Cervantes, but I never saw you as Don Quixote. Will you go to the Place de la Concorde and shout, any Arabs here? I was sitting on the balcony of the UN. A young man came in and sat next to me. We began to talk. I said to him, my dear sir, I am a Jew. I looked in his face. I saw no sign of embarrassment. So I asked him, who do you represent? When I pressed him, he said, Sharet. I said, I am an Israeli who dreams of peace with Egypt. For Egyptians, talking to Israelis was taboo. So Abdel Rahman Sadek was nervous when he was summoned by President Nasser. I went in and I found Gamal Abdul Nasser standing in the middle of the room. He said, I want to tell you that you have my permission to continue talks with the Israeli in Paris. The diplomats' reports were to be for Nasser's ears only. He said, 
I want you to see if there is a chance of avoiding bloodshed. While we conducted the talks with Abdel Rahman, there was, once in a while, a radical escalation of Egyptian statements about Israel. An Egyptian leader even said that Israel was the cancer in the midst of the Arab world, and we asked them to refrain from such inflammatory language. Nasser's envoy returned to Paris with promises to tone down the anti-Israeli propaganda on Cairo radio and to restrain the guerrilla raids against Israel. But Nasser would not terminate the war, nor would he establish diplomatic relations or allow Israeli ships through the Suez Canal and the Straits of Tehran. Charette was disappointed. Charette's message said that we were sorry, of course, that the Egyptian government would not change its official policy, which was a clear anti-Israeli policy. Charette's repeated offers to start peace negotiations were turned down. I had realized that the Israelis continuously say that they want peace. I realized also that the Arabs refused to talk. Israel desperately needed peace. Jewish refugees from Europe and Arab countries were streaming in. Its population doubled during the first two years. Its economy was in ruins. New immigrants were often settled along Israel's frontiers. They lived in fear of frequent Arab raids. Ben-Gurion blamed Nasser for the raids. He ordered the Israeli army to retaliate by striking Arab countries harboring infiltrators. Ben-Gurion ben-gurion knew arab villagers supported these terrorists we had to show them that helping terrorists was dangerous to protect our settlements i was called to see moshe diane a mother had been killed murdered on a settlement the murderers left tracks which led to a village across the border in jordan my orders were to reach the village in Jordan. We had to blow up as many buildings as possible and cause as many Arab casualties as possible. The tiny village of Kibya on the Israel-Jordan border is in ruins as day survivors relate how troops struck across the frontier at night. They accuse Israeli forces of leveling buildings with grenades, shell fire, and explosives, trapping entire families in the rubble. The attack prompts the United States, England, and France to deliver their sharpest rebuke to Israel since its founding and to demand stern action to punish the guilty troops. After the operation, I was called to see Ben Gurion. It was the first time I'd met him. Aaron, but I think about him. He said one thing to me. He said, it doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what they say about Israel anywhere else. The only thing that matters is that we can exist here. Unless it's clear that there is a price to pay for Jewish lives, we will not be able to survive. And that's what counts. Ben-Gurion was such a believer in the importance of agricultural settlements that he abandoned the prime ministership and joined a kibbutz in the desert. He was succeeded by Moshe Sharet, 
who hoped he could advance Israeli security through diplomacy. But his Minister of Defense, Pinchas Lavon, believed in military solutions. In July 1954, the British announced they were quitting their huge military base on the Suez Canal. We feared we would be exposed to an attack from Egypt. The fact that the British army was there served as a buffer. It reduced the chance of an Egyptian attack. On his own, Lavon ordered plans for destabilizing Egypt and frightening the British into remaining. Lavon summoned the director of military intelligence to his home in Tel Aviv. Lavon would not stop talking about the need for action. He suggested all sorts of schemes. We cooked up a plan to hit targets in Egypt. Lavon said, go ahead, activate the unit. In Egypt, Israeli military intelligence had recruited young Jews to act as saboteurs. I was ready to do anything to help Israel. I was idealistic. I was naive. A code word broadcast during Israeli radio's Housewives' Choice was the signal to act. In Cairo, I went to one cinema, my friend went to another. I put the bomb under an empty seat. No one was killed and the saboteurs were all caught. The news was splashed across Egyptian newspapers. So I went to Charette and said, look, uh, this is the communique from Cairo. What do you know about it? He said, no, 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 no. no. This is not our sentence, it can't be, because how can such a thing happen? <coughs> I, the prime minister, doesn't know about it. After he learned of Levan's role, Charette's first priority was to save the lives of the young Jews. Moshe Sharet called on me. He said, the cabinet is worried about the prisoners in Egypt. We must prevent death sentences. In a bid for mercy, Sharet sent Devon to Paris to reveal the truth to Nasser's envoy. Devon told me the plot was hatched in the Ministry of Defense. Charette had no idea about it. Nasser's response was not what Charette had hoped for. In Cairo, two of the saboteurs were executed. The others went to prison, Marcel Nino and Robert Dassa for 15 years. Charette, in his office that night, confided to his diary that he was living through a nightmare. If I do not remove Levon, I am supporting something rotten that will destroy the defense ministry and army command. If I do act, it will destroy the party and cause a scandal. What should I do? Lavon was dismissed from his post as defense minister, but the damage was done. Egypt also was playing with fire. In Gaza, it recruited and trained Palestinians for military action. They paid four pounds a month. In those days, it was a lot of money, so it was good. They were sent to Israel to gather intelligence and commit sabotage. They would see if an airport was built and come back and report. 
Others went on military operations and carried out attacks. These infiltrators, the Fedayeen, were a tremendous security problem, not only for the settlers on the borders, but also in the center of the country. They were attacking places five kilometers from Tel Aviv. The frequent attacks and the loss of lives were not only a disaster for the victims' families, they fostered a profound sense of helplessness among Israelis. The government seemed unable to protect its own people. Only one man could satisfy the public's demand for action. Within months, Ben-Gurion was back as prime minister. By mid-1955, Nasser turned to the Soviet bloc for economic and military assistance. The conflict now became part of the Cold War, and Egypt received a huge arms shipment from Czechoslovakia. New tanks, artillery, bombers, and jet fighters threatened to render the Israeli army and its propeller air force obsolete. General Moshe Dayan wanted to strike at the Egyptian army before it could absorb its new weapons. But Ben-Gurion felt Israel could not fight alone. Ben-Gurion became more and more convinced that uh, there is no diplomatic solution for the conflict. And because of the accumulation of arms in uh, Egypt, um, we have to forestall war triggered by Egypt. A few weeks later, President Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Unexpectedly, Ben-Gurion found himself with two new allies. Britain and France had jointly owned the canal and wanted it back. Ben-Gurion sent Shimon Peres to a secret meeting in Paris. The French defense minister told me Britain and France were planning an operation to take the Suez Canal back from Nasser. And he asked me, would Israel join them? How long would it take Israeli troops to reach the canal? Ben-Gurion waited anxiously for the return of his emissary. Ben-Gurion asked me, well, what did the French say? So I began to tell him about their plan. He interrupted and said, OK, this changes everything. We'll go with them. Israel invaded Egypt secretly supported by Britain and France. Within a week, Israeli troops had captured the Sinai Desert. Britain and France tried to retake the Suez Canal until international pressure forced them to withdraw. But for Israel, the war was a triumph. We achieved our main purpose. The main purpose was free navigation in the Straits of Elat, which is rather vital. And this we have until now. The second objective was to secure safety for our settlements near the Gaza Strip. I cannot say we got it entirely, but there are more safe than the war before. The Israeli forces withdrew from Sinai, and the positions along the Israeli border and the Straits of Tehran were guarded by United Nations forces. For 10 years, there was peace along the Israeli-Egyptian border under the UN flag. 